I'll start introducing Arnold Depperman, who is who is our next speaker. Uh, Arnold is professor of German linguistics at the University of Mannheim and also uh, the director of the pragmatic section of the Leibniz Institute for German language. Uh, I learned to know uh, Arnulf better uh, about 10 years ago when, when Arnulf was one of the three members of the scientific advisory board of the Center of Excellence of Intersubjectivity in Interaction, which was located in University of Helsinki. And, and since then we have had other, other collaborations. Uh, Arnulf indeed is visiting professor at the University of Helsinki at the Faculty of Social Sciences. Uh, I should say that uh, Arnulf has amazingly broad interests and, 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 and knowledge. Uh, conversation analysis, multimodality, interactional linguistics, positioning theory. And uh, regarding especially the talk today, it's also relevant that, that he he's initially trained as a psychologist and has, is, has got a wonderful ability to also to build links between language and interaction and psychological processes. Uh, his research topics have included narration, uh, identity, as well as understanding intersubjectivity and meaning in social interaction. And today, Arnulf, Arnulf's uh, uh, title is Invoking the Biographical Self as Therapist Resource in Psychodynamic, in the psychodynamic Therapy. So the floor is yours, Arnulf. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ansi and um, Nico, for inviting me to this um, exciting symposium. And um, in my talk today, I will uh, st address still another facet of uh, the self, and this is the biographical self, uh, an aspect which has not been discussed so much um, in the prior talk. So, um, of course, in some sense, it's uh, just trivial that the self is um, uh, in focus in psychotherapy, uh, because after all, it's about the patient's problems and the ways uh, of how the patient can change. And um, also, it's about an inqu inquiry into the patient's problems in their sources and origins. But uh, in a more technical and more theoretically imbued sense, uh, the self has come center stage in uh, psychoanalysis uh, with Cohort's theory of narcissism, uh, where uh, his focus on others as self-objects and the self as an object of the person's, that is also, of course, the patient's attention, conceptualization, and valuation. Now, when we think about what is going on in psychotherapy and how the self comes to the fore, then uh, narratives are the prime mode of uh, interaction and of communicating the self. But um, this is um, maybe it's worthwhile to dwell a moment on this, how this is done, because um, we can see that there are different temporal facets and also different um, pragmatic aspects of the self at issue here. So on the one hand, of course, we have the descriptive self that is the told self as a character. And when we are talking about narratives, then this is mainly the past self. Of course, then also the present self is at issue in terms of the, uh, how the patient feels at the moment and also the future self in terms of fears, plans and hopes for the future. Um, in terms of the temporal dimension still in the present, we have the self not only as a told character, but we have the telling self as well. That is the person who acts, who establishes some kind of relationship with a therapist and who displays their emotion. Um, we termed this self as the performative self, and this performative self often in Go the Goffmanian sense produces expressions given off, that is, expressions which are not so much intentionally communicated, but which, as Ekman and Friesen, I think it's also going back to Goffman, term emotional leakage. And this is different from the expressions given or the ex information given uh, in the narration itself. Uh, Narration, of course, is um, important and is uh, seen to be constitutive, even by many researchers, as um, constitutive of biography and the biographical self and some kind of narrative biographical identity. 
uh, this uh, idea especially has been become influential in philosophic writings, social philosophic writings by Paul Ricoeur, uh, Charles Taylor, or also in the th uh, more psychological theory of Jerome Bruner. Um, according to this uh, biography, uh, is a symbolic structure uh, which is created by narration. And this somehow uh, links up um, with um, the approach already uh, in, uh, present in Freud, who says that, of course, or he uses uh, biography as an explanatory resource to understand patients' conflicts, motivational dynamics, and patterns of defense and transference. Uh, now, when we ask how is this done in psychotherapy, and this will be uh, the topic of my talk today, uh, we can link back to uh, a paper by uh, Elena Weiste and Ansi Perekele uh, from a couple of years ago where they talk about the therapist's practice of relocating. Uh, they found that especially, and this is distinctive of psychoanalysis, as they found in sharp contrast to cognitive behavior therapy, they found that therapists use Used to use to use formulations which propose that the experiences described in the client's narratives were connected to experiences at some other times and places, and these other times and places, uh, of course, often have a uh, di biographical dimension or relate to some biographical configuration of the self. Uh, now, today in my study, I want to focus on these ways in which uh, therapists uh, relocate the patient's accounts uh, in their biographical self, that is how they create links uh, between the patient's narrative and the biographical self. And in particular, I will be dealing with the following research questions, in which way is the biographical self described? Uh, how does the therapist relate the biographical self to the patient's story? And um, part of this is the issue of how is this done linguistically? Um, then how is uh, knowledge about the biographical, biographical self of the patient warranted uh, by the therapist? At which moments in therapy actually does this happen? So when uh, and for what uses does uh, the therapist uh, invoke? the biographical self of the patient, and finally, how do patients respond to such references to their biography. Now, the data uh, that I've been using for my study come from three uh, psychodynamic focal therapies, which for 25 sections each, which have been uh, thoroughly coded for uh, therapists' um, interventions, um, questions, and uh, formulations. Um, they have been videotaped at the um, medical faculty of the University of Freiburg and courtesy by uh, Karl Eduard Scheidt. Um, I found in the transcribed extracts which I had uh, looked at, so 16 total, I found 19 instances of invoking the biographical self, and this is what uh, my study today, or my paper today, uh, builds on. Um, I will present you uh, uh, three cases now, unfortunately. Uh, I cannot show you the video, so I use this for the analysis. I can only um, make available uh, the transcripts to you. You find the transcripts with uh, the German, uh, sorry, with the English um, translation and the original German um, in the link uh, in the Zoom uh, chat or in the uh, YouTube chat. Um, in this talk today, I will be just reading out uh, the English translation of the transcript. Um, so now, as a first case, we um, can see how bi the biographical self is uh, introduced uh, by the therapist in order to enhance the relevance and to broaden the scope of an intervention. The case which we have here uh, includes a male client in his late 60s. He's suffering from depression and functional pain syndrome subsequent to the death of a family member and uh, the therapist uh, is a, a younger woman um, who is in the third year of her analytic training. The patient um, had repeatedly talked about health problems and the loss of competences and strength, strength especially uh, in the area of sports. And now uh, we turn here to a, a moment when the therapist um, links back to uh, a story which the uh, patient had told about his fears of not being able to drive anymore. So this is also related to loss of competences. 
therapist says, well, I ask myself, this is why I ask you about the driving as well, because time and again, it looks just like the topic about getting old here and some things don't work anymore like that. And when you're old, it's like that. Or if then it is like that, one must somehow, one depends on other people or one has to rely more on other people. And I have like asked myself a bit, if this is an issue for you, which occupies you? The patient says it is as well. Therapist confirms yes, patient again, absolutely. And then um, patient starts another story concerning his father and how his father um, drove when he still was 80 years old, but then he uh, couldn't do it anymore. And he compares it to his future fate and tells again about driving and how he likes driving. But then uh, at a certain point, the therapist um, let's uh, him continue this story but then at a certain point she uh, she chips in again and says well uh, I guess I meant this a bit differently so what I thought about kind of bit is like like the whole of your life you were very independent and very like for you you cared for yourself did not depend on other people and this was perhaps very important for you as well and this is also very comprehensible if one describes a bit about the biographical developments and where it was very difficult when you depended on your patients, sorry, <laughs> patients, yeah, on your parents and you freed yourself from this. And, and then you have achieved very, very much, you know, and got very much right in your life, you know, on the job, your family, your life. Um, but always of the stories you have told, actually always very much relying on yourself alone and not depending on other people and the car now is kind of a technical example so um and then she goes on um and um tells again a little bit about that she was not so much interested in the car because uh, the car issue would mean to rely on taxi drivers or public transport but she was more interested on the relationship issue in terms of the closer relationships and she says I ask myself if it is difficult for you to accept help from other people especially from people who are also close to you well now not like not necessarily the taxi driver patient um, confirms mm -hmm. um, and then then the patient starts a story saying well when I was on the ropes was really down right down at the bottom in my life then I was very grateful and um, my wife supported me much or when she caught me time and again as well, when I was in such pain again and somehow the dog bumped against me, against me or anything, this, um, this, um, this I have very much liked to draw on. So now here in this case, um, we can see that the therapist refers to the patient's biography and this was um, the bold phase passages of the transcript. Um, uh, when she does this, she does not mention specific life events. She, she does not tell a story. And this is very distinctive and regular in my data. But the biograph biographical narratives, which the patients had produced at some earlier point in um, the therapy, which often related to single events, now are uh, reformulated as co in a condensed abstract description here in terms of the attribution. You managed to do this very well, your family, your job. Um, the whole of your life. You did it all on your own. Um, second, this uh, knowledge about the patient's biography is rooted in their joint interactional history. And by the joint interactional history, I mean uh, the series of therapeutic sessions so far. Uh, she explicitly here refers to the stories that the patient has told. Um, the invocation of um, the patient's biography here serves to account for the therapist's questions about the fear of becoming dependent in the sense that the reference to the patient's biographical self clarifies the scope and the relevance of her question. So she shows that the question was much more fundamental and did um, cover much more areas of life, so to speak, and most importantly, more uh, close or closer relationships than what the patients actually told about and meaning that this uh, that this issue should be taken up more fundamentally more generally than the patient did in his first response where he again only talked about the driving issue.
Uh, this, again, also facilitates the communication of the therapist's hypothesis, why becoming dependent and accepting help might be a major problem for the patient. Um, the patient here does not obviously in any way reject the therapist's surmise that he might have difficulties in accepting help, but he tells a story about relationship, the relationship to his wife, which gives evidence to the contrary. And we can see this later that we have this, um, that we often have this very um, distinctive uh, mixture between uh, confirming, uh, confirming uh, the biographical portrait which the therapist gives, but not so much uh, really um, uh, engaging with a causal or uh, interpretive role which is assigned to the biography uh, by the therapist. Now let's move to a second case. It's from the same ther uh, therapeutical diet. Here uh, the uh, biographical experience is uh, invoked as an underlying motive. The patient had told how he was discriminated as a foreigner when working in Switzerland uh, uh, several years ago. And then he tells uh, how he quit the job in response to having been discriminated and he chuckles. And at this point the therapist comes in and interprets his chuckle as an, a display of rebellion. Um, <clears throat> so here we um, join the action here uh, with the um, ending of the patient's story. Um, and, and this was the first time I really felt being a foreigner. And this was a very good experience for me because then I understood, and, and then there's an overlap, he says, uh, what it means to be a foreigner, and therapists said uh, in overlap the meaning by this example, yes. And uh, patient carries on saying, before this work is done by a Swiss, it's done by a foreigner. So this is a quote from what his superior said to him um, before he quit the job. And I thought, no, he said, it's a self-quote. And then, yes, then hitchhiking uh, to Amsterdam away and the patient smiles and chuckles a bit. And therapist immediately responds saying, I hear so much in this chuckle, kind of a rebellion. I think just like you told, you know, about this very author authoritarian upbringing, if there was much like also still belated rebellion against the father. And patient um, says, well, probably against authorities. And therapist says, and yes, patient says, well, quite so. And the therapist says, are the authorities then this like uh, erased again, this again, this like? And patient confirms, yes, absolutely. And then also this mobbing at the school and then again had such a feeling, gosh, you're not though, you won't make it this way though. And he goes on to tell uh, still other stories of being uh, put down by some authority and how he tried to um, defend himself against this. So here again, we can see that um, the reference to the patient's biography is very much generalized. Uh, it is categorized as authoritarian upbringing by the father. Uh, the biographical ascription is again anchored in the interactional history of patients' prior stories about the father and his um, youth and uh, childhood. And um, the biographical self here is clearly invoked as a cause uh, in terms of a biographically motivated transference of em emotions. Rebellion, of course, is more than an emotion, but it has a strong emotional aspect uh, to it, uh, which were originally directed to his father. This uh, is not simply a, or not a straightforward uh, competing in, uh, explanation or challenge to the patient's account, but it still adds a different layer, another layer of explanation to the patient's narrated actions. You might remember that the patient very much displayed his agency in uh, in portraying his response, saying no, and um, he went off uh, and um, took his holidays in, in Amsterdam. So this was very much a display of autonomous um, agency and own decision. Here, um, the motivational account which uh, the therapist adds by this biographical uh, reference uh, explains the patient's performative display of pride on the one hand, so this is somehow new, pointing to, to some, well, subconscious or unconscious emotion, but it also um, 
it also uh, bolsters or underfeeds somehow the response of the toad self to the unjust in treat treatment as being motivated uh, by some emotions and uh, motivations um, with respect to his father, which seemed to be somehow symbolized or represented by uh, the superior in Switzerland. Uh, what follows now here, interestingly, is a negotiation because the patient supplants father by the more general categorization of authorities. And then he goes on to tell other experiences of being mistreated by superiors and institutional agents, but interestingly, not uh, by his father. Uh, there is a negotiation because um, the therapist is fast to uh, confirm this notion of uh, authority as well. But still, again, we can see that the somehow uh, a core of this biographical ascription is accepted, but not so much uh, its pre precise explanatory uh, value with respect to, to the uh, childhood experiences with the father. A uh, third case here um, is a little bit similar uh, to the second one in terms that here again the biographical self is invoked as an explanation here uh, for a patient's problem, not so much for a um, well, response or coping strategy. Um, the patient here, it's from a different case, is a young woman in her 20s and she's suffering from psychogenic uh, seizures. The therapist is uh, a psychoanalytically trained senior staff member um, the patient here tells a story uh, that she did not tell others, in particular not her mother, when she felt bad because she did not want to cause trouble for others. And the therapist now suggests that these seizures which the patient has and which she did not link to these not telling about troubles, he links th them, he says first they break out after an accumulation of withheld stressful feelings and then he links this to the patient wish to avoid afflicting others, which uh, at least from his, in his view seems to be based on the biographical experience with their mother. Now so let's see uh, how the sequence plays out. The patient here tells about her um, avoidance um, of telling uh, problems, um, of telling others or close relatives, close people about her problems. Um, and she f starts first with her mother saying, there with her, I couldn't do it somehow. And the others, I don't know, it is also somehow protection though, but you then confide people who like to have with you, but somehow, I don't know, I, I don't very exactly know why. But actually, I kind of wanted to protect everybody and not cause any trouble. Therapist says, this is perhaps therefore a very important point because it perhaps also a bit lies together that in this way you accumulate again so much of uh, stressful feelings of sadness because of pain, disappointment and anger in yourself, which then in these seizures, uh, when the threshold is reached, break out possibly. Patient says, mm hmm. Therapist co continues, and that, that is an important point, though. Uh, what becomes clear here from what you say is that you just, that it is perhaps an overall attitude of yours as well, that you don't want to much excessively afflict and dem make demands on others. So now, here at that point, um, the patient does not respond in any way, and, and in the end, a pause of uh, about almost 15 seconds uh, emerges. So, meaning that the patient has not taken any stance on the therapist's intervention. And now the therapist uh, starts to uh, uh, make this biographical link, saying, and perhaps this is linked to the fact that the mother just, for instance, had to fight frequently with her health pain that she was in pain and you perhaps had the feeling it is now the ceiling was like relatively thin there so you don't want to lay something more onto it and the patient confirms saying yes well that's definitely the case with my mom um, yes because I witnessed uh, her breakdown clearly when she came to the hospital in Warstein so here in this third case um, we can see th again that the uh, therapist condenses prior stories of the patient into the description of a biographical key experience, namely not uh, being afraid of um, putting too much to overstrain the mother by telling uh, some, uh, uh, but by telling about her own problems. Uh, the biographical fact here is also introduced as being in common ground. It is referred to, um, for instance, uh, by uh, definite uh, 
um, article, but it's not explicitly here referred back uh, on and anchored uh, in the interactional history by saying what you told me or something like this. Um, the bi biographical self is here uh, again invoked as a causal motivational explanation um, in the sense that the biographical self, or sorry, the, the biographical relationship of the patient to her mother is suggested as a factor that accounts for or at least contributes to the p development of patients' seizures. However, um, if we look uh, more closely into the linguistic design of the turns, the precise relationship between uh, the biographical self and patient's symptoms remains rather indeterminate, and we can see this in many um, of the extracts that some a causal role is suggested, but it's not really coded. So um, there are formulations like this reminds me of, or this might play a role, or this connects to, or has a relationship with. So all these sorts of terms are used to somehow suggest causality, but not really to uh, pin this down exactly and make the claim that there's a causal relationship, of course, thereby inviting the patient to explore further what the precise role of the biographical uh, self uh, could be in, for instance, causing certain problems or developing certain defense uh, mechanisms. Uh, the patient uh, here in this case again confirms and adds a consistent story about the mother which corroborates uh, the, um, the um, uh, therapist's ascription about the relationship to her mother, but he does not uh, take up the issue of a connection between her biographical experience and her seizures. So now uh, to wrap this up a bit and to come back, uh, tie this back to the initial questions, how is the biographical self described? We can see that in the data, references to single biographical events and actions by the therapists are very rare. Mostly, it is uh, they are aggregated, condensed, abstract categorizations and descriptions which formulate prior stories and which can, uh, like, uh, mostly in the first case, you could see this very clearly, uh, amount even to trait-like personality ascriptions. Um, then uh, the uh, knowledge about the biographical self is um, warranted always by the therapist. They refer back to patient statements from the therapy. Um, common ground is indexed in various ways linguistically by anaphoric, uh, definitive, de sorry, definite uh, demonstrative articles and pronouns by modal particles, which is in German a usual way to refer back to common ground, and by attributes of repetition. There are also using quotes from the patient um, and, of course, um, patient's therapist's own formulations, which somehow summarize patient's uh, stories. Uh, interestingly, therapists never, in not one uh, example which I had, construct a purely speculative biographical reference uh, in the sense of, well, maybe this has got something to do with your father. This never happens. Uh, it's always rooted in the interactional history. Uh, so how is the biographical self related to the patient's story? Um, mostly it is invoked uh, in some kind of a, as a causal explanation, sometimes rather as an anal analogy or as a frame uh, in which the patient's story uh, is contextualized. Uh, mostly um, the uh, precise relationship between uh, the biographical self and the story or the current self of the patient is not named. Uh, in very exact terms, but the, there is a range of linguistic means which can uh, include very uh, clear-cut causal connectors, but then, as I said, expressions that rather claim an association which suggests causality or just thematic association or just analogy. Um, when is the biographical self invoked? This is interesting. It's not invoked um, randomly or at every possible point, but it is precisely invoked to pursue an intervention that the patient has not taken up earlier, at least not in a way that the therapist considers to be adequate or sufficient. Um, it supports uh, the interpretation or the intervention and provides additional evidence, so this is one of its uses. Then, however, often it also specifies the background and the function of the therapist's questions and interpretations, and in this way makes more explicit um, what the therapist's hypothesis about the patient's problem and their causes actually is and thus um, fosters the or advances the intelligibility of the patient's, of the therapist's um, 
intervention. Um, how do patients respond? And I think um, this is maybe the point where I might not be able to generalize at all, but at least in my data, patients confirm uh, almost always, or they always confirm the biographical reference and often add, as you could see, further supportive story components. But only very rarely the patients really inquire more deeply into the possible causal role of the biographical self, that is the precise function of its invocation is not so much attended to. So as a, um, as a concluding note, I want to um, maybe adopt a still a more abstract um, perspective on the phenomena I've been talking about. What struck me is that we have three orders of temporality in, in uh, psychotherapeutic interaction, which are here very nicely and in, in distinctive ways related to each other. This is the biography of the patient the interactional history of this therapeutic diet that is the series of therapeutic sessions they had so far, and the precise moment in which the intervention is produced in the sequence, in the therapeutic sequence. And there is a systematic relationship between these three temporal orders. That is, the patient's biographical self is available only via the unfolding interactional history between the patient and the therapist. That is, knowledge of biographical self requires a re-relationship in the sense of shits, but different to shits. It's not so much only about shared experience, but it's about becoming acquainted via autobiographical storytelling. Uh, the shared interactional history then allows the therapist to use the patient's biographical self as a resource to transcend the confines of the here and now of the sequential uh, interaction that is the materials which the patient has uh, delivered adjacently in their talk. And it now allows the therapist to construct sequential trajectories in terms of asking questions, initiating new topics, telling about biographical associations which are not provided for by the sequential moment that is, they are not prefigured or projected in any way, but here it is precisely important that in psychotherapy, as opposed to many other types of interaction, we often have moments where there is no clear conditional relevance and where there is much freedom for participants to introduce new uh, topical resources. And this is precisely what therapists use and do at these moments. Thank you very much.